Thanks, Teddy, and thanks everyone for, for joining this morning for SecCon. We're excited to talk a little bit about this concept of training your humans. So like Teddy mentioned, uh, Curricula is a fun online training company that basically focuses on making security awareness fun by using storytelling. So we're going to talk a lot about different ways that we can conceptualize what a security awareness program covers, what it should be, what it shouldn't be, learn from case studies. We're going to cover the four pillars of what a security awareness program basically should entail. And then we're going to move on to kind of the concept of how to use storytelling right away after this conference to help improve your own programs at home. So a lot of visuals, a lot of, a lot of stuff to kind of bring this to life, but excited to talk to you guys about how to make security awareness program better. So why do we do it, right? At the end of the day, when we look at what we're doing to employees is this. So we have hundreds of these and you can go search on Twitter for people that get caught in phishing simulations that hate their security awareness training, that get angry at their IT teams, that resent security controls, all because of what we're doing to them. And they're publicly talking about it, about how stupid their programs are and how annoyed they are by, by going through this. This isn't good, right? And this is more of, uh, yeah, whatever, if they just post this. Well, what we're doing to our employees is we're actually creating this type of resentment against the security and IT controls that we provide for them to make them more protected because they feel that they're not cared for. So if I were to give you a highlight out of today's kind of keynote here of what I believe the rest of this conference stands for is caring. At the end of the day, if we don't care about our employees and all of the things that we're doing for security, then we're gonna get the results we expect, which is not good. And if we do put in the effort and the, the caring and the attention that these security programs, security awareness and everything else needs, well, then we're gonna get the results back that we're expecting. So let's not have this kind of stuff happen. Let's work towards a better future. So when you think of security awareness programs, at the end of the day, our goal is to change a long-term behavior. And a lot of awareness programs and training and everything else in between is designed for short-term incentives, short-term behavior, short-term goals. Basically, hey, can we get through a SOC 2 audit? Hey, can we get through this compliance uh, audit and, and just make sure everyone gets the training done? We all know it. We all understand that's kind of a priority in most businesses. So how do we change that? How do we make implementation intention towards a long-term change? Well, it starts with again, caring, starts with establishing a culture inside of our company. Now, I've seen this word culture used and abused throughout my career. And I spent over seven years working for the federal regulator of our power grid in North America, an agency called NERC. And I did everything and anything in between with the word cybersecurity to help protect our power grid from regulations to audits, to investigations and advisory. And when I would hear culture being mentioned, it was all talking about firewalls and appliances and we have a strong culture. Well, that's not culture. Culture is the ideas and customs and behaviors amongst a particular group of people or society. So we all know what culture is. You come into work and right now we're on a remote working culture and it's very different. But here in Atlanta, where curricula is based out of, we actually have a, a pretty unique culture in our company and the office environment we're working. It's called the Atlanta Tech Village. And in the Atlanta Tech Village, there's people riding around on scooters and walking around flip-flops. And it's, it's unusual to see someone walk in with a suit on because they, they stick out like a sore thumb. So if you think of your organization, you have a culture and subcultures within it on how people kind of act and interact with each other. So if we're talking about building a security culture, that concept is the same thing, except for it's the ideas, customs, behaviors, stories amongst a group or society that allows all of them to be free from danger and threats. So all we're adding on is that last part of the puzzle is that as a community, we're working together to stop the bad stuff coming our way. We help each other. A culture is not a fishing test. A culture is not one person reporting a phishing email. It's not. It's a community working together to stop bad stuff. So we got to think of culture in that way. And a lot of times when we're focused on the metrics of 
what we're trying to get out of these programs, which we'll talk about later, well, then we're going to learn that establishing a culture is actually the exact opposite of a lot of things that we've been doing over the past few years. So think about culture of safety, you know, especially here in, in the United States, when you cross the street, you look both ways. Why is that? Well, you don't want to get blasted by a, a speeding car. So in other countries, that's not true. They don't have that same mindset when they cross the street. They just kind of cross and maybe there's like animals roaming around and they don't really have this mentality of safety that, that we've established for looking both ways. We all know to do it. That's part of our culture, part of our instinct. So we're gonna learn how to apply some of this stuff into your organization. So the first statement is the why, right? If we're talking about the four pillars of what it takes to break down a security awareness program, the why is a pretty important statement. Gotta have a, a motive to get this done, gotta have a culture, wanna protect our company and our employees from external threats. Second part of building a security awareness program is this motivation concept. And motivation is, is tough. You know, well, I gotta get through a compliance audit. So that's my motivation. I get it, right? We all have compliance stuff to do, but that should not be your motivation to run a security awareness program. If it is, and if it's the sole reason on why you have a security awareness program, uh, don't even bother, right? Just, just send an email out that says, please don't get hacked this month. And it'll probably do the same thing because compliance, as we all know, is not security, especially when it comes to security awareness. We have to put in the effort if we wanna get the results, gotta care. Now, when it comes to motivation, the first instinct is, hey, let's give people gift cards for completing things. And that's cool, uh, it's short-lived. No company in this world has enough money to incentivize every employee with gift cards. So we gotta think bigger. We gotta think of incentives and motivation as a bigger mission here. And when you break down kind of how do you motivate uh, people and organizations, there's two different concepts that we're going to talk about. One is the institutional goal, and the other is the individual goal. So institution being your organization, individual being your employees. They both have different reasons on why they do things. Your institution, your company has a motive to not get hacked, right? As a company collectively, they do not want to get hacked. Why? You lose money got to fire employees. You might have to report stuff in the news. You got to put an insurance claim. There's an incredible amount of weight to why an institution doesn't want to get hacked. Now on the employee or the individual goal, do they really care? At the end of the day, if they get hacked, if their account gets hacked, if their company gets hacked, most likely they're going to show up to work. They're still going to get a paycheck. They're not going to get fired. All of these things in between with a, a subset of certain employees, like maybe a CISA would have a lot of sweat after a hack take place, but a regular everyday employee doesn't have the same motivation that the institution has. So our goal is to align those incentives together to get them to kind of meet a com common enemy, a common goal that we're reaching to defend against the bad guys with different motivations along the way. Now, in order to get there, not easy. That doesn't mean that uh, you know, we both can easily work towards that same path. We have to build individual incentives for our employees to get them motivated to do things. So let's talk about a case study there on how we can make that a reality. So there was this uh, zooming out of security awareness world. There was a park in Europe that had a tremendous problem with trash. Trash everywhere, garbage, people throwing stuff on the floors, uh, leaving trash everywhere you can see, and the park was pretty dirty. So the city got together and said, well, what are we going to do about this trash situation? And, you know, they, they started talking about it and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to uh, put a fine in place. If someone throws trash in the ground, we're going to put up a sign here that says, hey, $500 fine if we catch you littering, right? Pretty common. We see this stuff all over the place. They put up the signs, they spent the money on it, they uh, put them in the park, and what do we think happened? Nothing, because there was just a bunch of signs that said, hey, please don't do this, there's a fine, but no one to enforce it. So back to the drawing board. So the city got together and said, well, we spent all this money on signs, uh, what's going on? I mean, that's a pretty hefty penalty. How do we, how do we change behavior here if, if the, the financial incentive isn't, isn't doing it? Well, uh, duh, well, we have the fines there, but we have no one to enforce it. 
So let's go hire some security guards to walk around the park and try to watch people and spot them as they're littering so they can enforce the rules that we put in place. So now they got more costs where they have security guards running around the park trying to find people and spot people throwing trash on the ground. Well, again, unsuccessful because when people are being watched like that, they act differently. So again, the problem was not solved through there. So rewind, back to the drawing board. They brought in an outside agency, a creative agency to try to figure this out. And the agency's job was to figure out how to change behavior of people that go to the park. So instead of trying to use the compliance method and enforcement method of, of penalties and, and enforcement audits along the way, they tried to think a little bit different. And what they did is they went to every single trash can in the park and they installed little devices under the lids of those trash cans. And when an employee walked up to a, tra or when a, uh, a person in the park walked up to a trash can and threw out a piece of garbage, it made this noise. That's weird. What the heck was that? Grab another piece of trash, throw it into the can. What? Sounded like you just dropped this piece of trash down a 10,000 foot hole as a bowling ball. So now people were literally running out of their way to find trash, to throw it into the garbage can so they could hear this noise, the reward, the incentive. They started texting their friends and calling their friends and posting stuff on social media saying, this is crazy. I don't know what's going on at this park. There's these little sound devices all over the place. Sounds like you're throwing this garbage down a big giant hole. So moral of the story is no money, no financial incentive to get people to throw out the trash. The trash flipped its script, turned around, cleaned up its act. It, I think at the end of the day, it was like 4X production on the amount of garbage being put into the garbage cans and success, success, success. So if you think about this concept inside of your organization on motivation, the park's institutional goal was let's not get people litter. That is not the same goal that a park goer has. So we had to make a different type of motivation or incentive to get them to align to our institutional goal. Each organization has stuff like this. Each organization can put in that extra effort to get a motivation to meet their goal of not getting hacked. So we know the why is important, right? Why we don't want to get hacked as an institution. We know that motivation is important to get people to do stuff. Well, okay, what do we do to deliver it? So this is kind of the third pillar here, delivery. Uh, once a time exercise sucks. We know it, right? The If we go to the gym, right? Let's talk about being fit. If my job was to be, hey, Nick, you hired me to be the the uh, trainer for your organization as a, a healthcare worker. Well, if I, had a, if I were to say to your employees, hey, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna go on the treadmill and we're gonna run as fast as we can for 30 minutes. Uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna lift every single weight in this gym and then you're gonna eat a salad after. Great day. I'll see you next year. Thanks for being a, a super healthy person. You're good for a year. Uh, you'd say, Nick, you're the worst health coach in the entire world. You're gonna ask for your money back and you're gonna say this is a waste of time. Why are we doing this on our security awareness game? For some reason, we think that that works. We do the once a year exercise in December with our HR training, our sexual harassment training, our HR uh, uh, performance reviews, our checkoffs. And then by the way, stuff the security awareness in there doesn't work. So we got to think of security awareness just like we think of exercising and becoming healthy. We got to do this every single month, every week. We got to make progress on working towards our ultimate goals. So once a year, no way. And then we got the problems of trying to choose just one channel. So uh, uh, send out an email, right? Please don't get hacked this month, terrible. It's not gonna do its job. It's just gonna go in one ear out the other. Most people aren't even gonna look at it. Uh, posters, super cool. Uh, we're not in offices, posters don't work. People are at home. How do you get their attention? Well, oh, we'll put them on our internet. Do people really look at these things on the internet? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. The goal of all of this is putting up a silly poster like this, and these are, these are just funny examples of just really bad security awareness posters, uh, is not gonna do the job by itself. It's there to be a, a piece of the puzzle to drive a bigger incentive towards a bigger program. So think about that when you're creating content and working through these, these motions here is, 
you know, just putting up a poster, just sending in an email and hoping for the best is not going to work. It's the collective action of how we bring everyone together into a bigger program is what makes security awareness successful. So death by PowerPoint. PowerPoint sucks. We all know it. Why? It's not the tool itself. It's the fact of how we use the tool and abuse the tool is what makes it bad. And there's this uh, expert syndrome where we all think that everyone knows everything and then we put too many words and then we get the lawyers involved and it winds up turning into this really bad show with 75 slides that just makes an employee miserable. So the death by PowerPoint experience is the thing we have to change. It's not the lack of information. It's the change in perspective on how we deliver that information. So if we utilize a different concept here and try to change the way that we're gonna design our programs for the future, I would like everyone to go back and think about what they're doing today. And if you have death by PowerPoint, or if you have a 45 minute narrative of a criminal talking to you in a video, uh, not gonna work. We gotta change that perspective and get people to actually be motivated on things that get them excited in their own lives. So what we're advocating for is this concept of uh, Baker versus Baker paradox. So the way it works is this. If I were to introduce to you to my friend on the call today here and say, hey, I got my friend Baker, they're joining us. Thanks Baker. And they have a giant name tag and then they walk away. And I were to call every one of you after this, maybe a month from now, even a couple of days from now and said, do you remember the person I introduced? Remember what their name was? Chances are you don't care. It means nothing to you. It was just a name on a, on a piece of paper. Now, alternatively, if I were to bring someone up on this call and say, hey, I want to introduce you to my friend. My friend is a baker. Hey, they come on with a big funny hat and you start to think of fun things about what bakers are and what they do. Maybe you like to bake yourself. Hey, maybe being uh, at home for so long, you, you took up the hobby of baking. Maybe there's a favorite bakery that you like to support. And you know what? I haven't visited there in a while. You start to tie together all of these thoughts and concepts from your experiences into this mindset of what a baker is, not just the name baker. So when we're building security awareness and any online training, this concept of storytelling is what we're empowering you to do. Let's not just write down words and policies, let's tell stories. Let's communicate experiences to our employees because heck, that works. It really makes an impact with people. And I'll give you an example. So there was a, uh, there's a book called The Memory Illusion. And in this book, they talk about a study that took place. And in this study, they got together a bunch of people that came in and they told them about a story of when they were younger, they were uh, at a wedding and they knocked over a giant punch bowl at the wedding. It crashed and caused a lot of craziness at the wedding. So uh, they asked them, you know, hey, do you remember the story and can you tell me more about it? And about 25% of the participants remember uh, the, the story and they recall explicit details about the story. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, my mom took me to the car and yelled at me and this and that and you know, blah, 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 and all of these, these explicit details. Another 15% of them don't remember explicit details, but they remember the story. They remember it happening. Yeah, yeah, I knocked over that big punch ball. It's crazy. The crazy part about all of this, 40% of people that were told this story recalled it. Uh, it's fake. It didn't happen. Did not happen to them at all. Completely made up. It was a story that was told to see if we can convince people about memorizing or remembering stories. And it works. There's science behind storytelling that makes this a reality. Um, some of them is called confabulation, which is the emergence of memories that never took place. So uh, nerd psychology language here. And then source confusion, which is forgetting the source of information and thinking it was a memory. So the power of what you can do with storytelling inside of your employee security awareness training is unbelievable. And there's science behind this. This is not just let's get a bunch of slides from lawyers in front of our employees. Let's tell and communicate a story of how something could or should impact our organization. That will go a long way. So to break down another example of that, there is, uh, you know, when you think of learning, learning can't happen without attention and, and memory. Those two together is learning. 
those two segmented is just one or the other. Memory, I memorize stuff for a test or attention, hey, super fun, but I didn't learn anything from it. So there's a, uh, uh, my background coming from the utility space, we work with a lot of regulated utilities uh, over in North America, and they have these this concept of protecting the power grid with these little, uh, uh, what we call BCAs, BES cyber assets. They're basically the servers and computers that help prevent and protect our infrastructure and power our infrastructure. So as a con concept, we basically broke them down into a red box in our training, call them BCA, very memorable, very recognizable when you see it in the training. So we also use the story of the three little pigs. So I'll huff and puff and steal your best cyber assets. So we, we use this fun little narrative of how to protect these things in the little houses of one, the big bed wolf blows down the the house that had no protection. And then gradually the, the third pig gets smarter and smarter along the way. So if you think of this concept, we use the simple story that we all know to communicate a complex subject of, hey, these things are super important. Uh, when you see them, make sure they're protected, put them in safe places. Well, we went so far as we actually just made them. We just got little red boxes made up and we ordered them and got them printed and we sent them out to customers said, do what you will with these, use them, put them places, put them in the rooms where the other ones exist. And sure enough, they put them in the rooms at the door. So when you walked into a door and you saw the little red smushy box, well, now you had a mental marker, the mental marker that connected the physical world to the digital world of the training to make sure that people were connecting the dots on the reality of what they're learning in their experiences. That was fun, right? And there's a lot of organizations that I heard similar stories doing stuff like this, where they'll have training and they bring it to life. They physically do stuff in real life to make this reality for their employees. So think about what your red boxes are at home. The last concept, right? We, we know the why, we know we gotta motivate people and then we gotta talk about delivery of content with death by PowerPoint and how to do it periodically instead of once a year. Well, the last part is measuring. How do I measure security awareness program? How do I communicate it? What do I communicate? How does my how do my executives uh, you know review success and how is HR measuring culture? I should probably be following those same principles here. Well, one place to start but not end is phishing tests, right? When we talk about security awareness, the first thing that I'm sure came to your head was, well, I got phishing tests. Phishing tests are a component of a security awareness program. It is not a security awareness program. It's a phishing test. So with training people is not just sending phishing tests out. Training people is talking and communicating about all the things that make up your organization's culture and the subculture of security on protecting sensitive info, physical security, uh, not emailing certain things, phishing, and everything in between. So if we're just focusing on, on numbers that get spit out of a system, then we're not doing our jobs as IT professionals and IT uh, security executives to make sure that our dreams become a reality with the security cultures we want. More importantly, when we run phishing tests, we're not looking at the emotional impact of our employees. Uh, this is Peter. This is Peter who just fell for a phishing test and got reamed out by his executive management. Why? Because we don't know how to talk to our employees about this. We send them through remedial training and poorly designed software that basically makes employees feel really bad about themselves. Why is that important? Well, just like we saw on the social media, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people talking about how they hate their organizations and what they do to them. Well, how do you think Peter feels? What do you think he's gonna do when he gets another phishing email? He's scared. Right, And by making people scared, we're not opening up the doors to having them communicate with us and share really, really important information about phishing and bad stuff coming our way so we can help the rest of the organization defend against it. And when we look at that, right, being in the, the wrong place, the right place, the right time, I mean, this is what phishing tests are. We have trained employees now to be more scared of phishing simulations than real fish. And that's super sad. Why? Because we put all of these bad things on phishing simulation tests and not on the, the reporting and the good and, and how are you helping us? So we need to change our emotional intelligence and our attitude towards how we use phishing simulations in the first place. It's to train people. It's to get people bought in on what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, why they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
and getting them to feel comfortable talking about these things. So we got to get them to not resent security in the first place. We got to make sure that we're all working to the same beat and the same rhythm. So ultimately, well, how do we do that, right? What we do and what anyone can do is uh, we make stories. So uh, Dee Dee is one of our five-year-old hackers. She runs our phishing simulator in our software. So when you get caught by a phishing test, it's not the big bad IT shop anymore. It's a character that you know and love from our stories and our episodes and our training. And now you start to connect the dots between a persona of the digital world that we've created to the real world of bad people. And Dee Dee's kind of fun because people start making stories about her. Of, I hate Dee Dee. I love Dee Dee. Dee Dee's super cool. They make uh, you know wallpapers about her. They have Slack channels talking about her. To, to every time something bad comes in, they talk about it on there. It's super cool to see what people have done with this persona of Dee Dee. So we love Dee Dee. We use her obviously all the time in our communications. So it's up to you to make your own program either using a vendor like us or building your own story world to try to communicate security awareness in a more fun way. Because if we could put a smile on our employees' faces and get them to interact with us in a more positive way, we're going to get better results. So ultimately, I'm going to recap those four core pillars here. It's the why we do it. We don't want to get hacked. We got to align our institutional goal versus our individual goal with motivation. We got to change our delivery mechanism. We got to get rid of death by PowerPoint and the 45 minute, you know, boring narrated videos of someone talking that no one cares about. We need to change that. And then measuring, we got to look beyond phishing tests. We got to look at measuring the same way our HR teams measure culture and qualitative assessments of our company. We got to do the same thing with our security awareness programs. Ultimately, that'll get us towards building a better security culture. Lastly, um, for us, I, we're sponsoring this event. So, you know, for us, we have security awareness training. We tell stories. We have a lot of fun with it. We have phishing simulator, like you mentioned with Didi. We have a free tool for unlock computer. When you do go back to the office, if you go to unlock computer, you get a dancing Didi on the screen that um, helps reiterate in a positive way to never leave your computer unlocked again. And then we have some cool tools where you can actually create your own stories inside of our platform with our creator tool. That lets you use the same tools that our team does internally to build your own custom online training alongside all of our other fun episodes in our security awareness platform. But with that, I will thank Teddy and team for letting me speak today to you guys about a, a pretty passionate topic of ours. Uh, join our fight in defending against Didi and you can check us out at curricula.com. Awesome. Nick, thank you so much for that talk. Um, it looks like we had got a couple of questions in the Slack channel. Let's see. So the first one is, Nick, what would you say is the most effective approach for coaching serial clickers and other employees who do not seem to absorb the security training materials? It's a great question. So uh, one is don't put them through remedial training immediately. Like, just don't do it. Um, think about if you had a physical office and someone forgot to lock the door at night and you asked them to lock the door and then uh, they did it. The first offense, you'd be like, what the heck? Uh, you didn't lock the door. Someone could have stole a bunch of stuff. What if you saw them do it again and again and again and again? Well, there's something wrong there. And the only way to find out what's wrong and what they're not getting is by talking to them. And I know that sounds crazy in a world where Automation is kind of like part of our everyday lives, but have a real conversation and ask a lot of questions and hit them emotionally first before you start just pumping them through guidance and training because that will make the biggest difference to find the direction. Awesome. And then one more question. Which group is the best at ensuring cybersecurity training occurs and is impactful? IT, HR, management, individual employees, et cetera all of them. So the, the biggest problem with security awareness is for some reason, we just pump that onto security's shoulders and say, you're the only one that's in charge of this. That's insane. Um, there's got to be an ambassador board. So uh, I could probably do a whole nother talk on this, but an ambassador team that basically supports the entire organization's security culture as a whole, made up of HR, finance, security, employees, you name it, representatives of every part of the organization, because that group and the whole company is responsible for whether we win or whether we lose in the long run. 
So if we work together, we'll have a lot more accountability together on whether we're successful or not successful.